Power. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Laura Young, and I'm the Senior Program Manager for this T the CPAN program here at UT Health Science Center, the Child Psychiatry Access Network. Um, today, uh, we have a, um, an excellent presentation uh, by Dr. Kenneth Montfort. Um, he is with the U UT Health Science Center in Houston, and we'll get started here in just a moment. Um, if you would go ahead and mute your microphones, please. And if you have questions, please do add them in the chat throughout the presentation today, and we will certainly get to those questions at the end. So let me share with you about Dr. Monfort. So Dr. Monfort received his Bachelor of Arts with a major in psychology and a minor in educational studies from what is now the College of Idaho in 2002. After graduation, he spent two years working at the Jude Vine Center for Autism in St. Louis, Missouri, where he spent two years as the program manager for the Residential Support Living Program for Adults with Autism. In 2004, Dr. Monfort moved to Houston where he worked as a research coordinator in a private practice that specialized in relationship development intervention, also known as RDI. In 2006, he went to teach at the, at the Westview School, a small private school in Houston that serves academically capable students on the autism spectrum. And after several years at Westview, he moved into a position as a behavior specialist to support families, students, and staff members with a variety of behavioral and psychological challenges. 2012, Dr. Montfort received his Master of Arts degree in clinical psychology from Feeling Graduate University and he attended his pre-doctoral internship at the UT University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston and the psychiatry department during the 2016-2017 academic year. Afterwards, he went full-time to the Westview School New Diagnostic Clinic, the Stewart Center. Dr. Monfort graduated magna cum laude with his PhD in clinical psychology from Fielding in 2018 and obtained full licensure in 2019. Due to COVID, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and policies restricting building access for new clients, the psychological services department at the Stewart Center closed. At present, Dr. Monfort is working with several mentors and friends from UT Health in Houston He's been working and helping to develop both the CPAN and TCHAT programs under Senate Bill 11 and is working to create new ways to provide quality autism related, autism related services to difficult to reach patients across Texas. Dr. Montfort's clinical training includes solution oriented brief therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, family systems therapy, and behavior modification, ABA applied behavior analysis. His clinical interests include family functioning and parental stress, parent coaching, improving quality of life for individuals with developmental disabilities, clinical assessment, and community awareness and education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kenneth Munford. Thank you, Laura, for that great introduction. I'm excited to be here, and I look forward to getting the chance to present some information today. Um, let's see, how do I get my slideshow? There we go. Not showing me the option to share here. There we go. Sorry for the delay. It seems to be the day for technical difficulties. Not a problem. You let me know how I can help. There we go. Is that oh, looking excellent. right? Yes, that looks great. Okay. All right. Um, as um, Laura introduced me, I've, and my name is Ken Montfort. I work at UT Health Science Center in Houston. Um, these are some colleagues and friends of mine I've known for quite some time, but I've only been here in this position for um, about nine months. Um, uh, my presentation today is about the uh, relationship between the primary care providers um, and the, the rest of the community in terms of how to best support uh, our patients with autism. Um, this is a, was a tough thing for me to boil my, my presentation down into a one-hour presentation, 
uh, this is something I can present about you know any one of these slides pretty much uh, for most of the hour. So uh, if there is interest, I'm happy to come back and do more. Dr. Montfort, I believe we just lost your audio. I think you're on mute. There, there we said, go. Someone muted you. I should be back on now. Okay. Um, so um, I look forward to kind of going through these things as we as we go. I would love to have comments and questions thrown into the chat, and I'd be happy to talk about those at the end um, if there's something that that you want to talk about in more detail. Um, you've already seen a disclosure slide, so I won't need to read this, but I have no financial relationships to, to disclose. <clears throat> and our learning objectives for today um, are going to cover the to evaluate the stressors that are inherent in raising a child with developmental disability. And I use that term as a general broad term that includes autism spectrum disorder and how that, that how that stress may affect family functioning. I'd like for us to be able to recognize mainstream and empirically supported treatment modalities uh, and develop a strategy for helping those patients to, to evaluate and select appropriate treatment options. Um, ideally, we would have <clears throat> the ability to identify reliable and appropriate professionals for future referrals. Um, and I'm hoping that, that when these slides are provided to you after this presentation, um, you'll find that they're useful in terms of um, some of the, the links and the information that I've included there for your reference uh, later on. Um, I don't need to read anybody here the diagnostic criteria for autism. You all have a DSM and or an ICD. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to talk a little bit about how autism fits into uh, the field in general. They're still, despite uh, increased awareness and a lot of efforts by the community to, to um, share what autism is, you know, we still have some general misconceptions, not just in the general population, but also in the medical profession about how what autism is and what it looks like. Um, so I'll just sum it up kind of briefly that autism is a complex neurobiological disorder. Um, you'll note that that doesn't say it is, it's that it's a behavioral disorder. We tend to notice the behaviors. That tends to be something that we key on when we're looking for autism, but it is not inherently a behavioral disorder. Um, the primary impairments, as you probably know, are in communication, social interaction, imaginative play and thought processes, uh, and then restricted of activities and interests. Um, you probably already know that autism is a spectrum disorder. Uh, that means it can range from mild to severe. Um, there is uh, a famous saying in the autism world that if you meet if you meet one child with autism, you have met one child with autism because they are all very unique and different, and there are no um, <clears throat> no safe massive generalizations that you can make across the whole group. Um, you will probably notice that there are some inappropriate or awkward or rigid, um, maybe even disruptive behaviors that are frequently associated with autism. However, as I said before, it's not a behavioral disorder. Um, <clears throat> underlying communication problems, sensory issues, those things that we uh, kind of those those sequelae of the underlying impairments can often manifest as what we call unacceptable behavior, and that's often what we first notice with autism. Um, I want to kind of go through a couple of different types of assessment for ASD, and one of the the things I've been tasked with is to kind of help um, medical professionals to understand how what you do as medical professionals fit with what I do and with, with whatever other professionals do uh, in other parts of the field. And so I can sum up the medical part pretty easily. You guys are the, are the experts here, of course. Um, <clears throat> but in a medical evaluation of ASD can happen in a simple office visit. Um, it is often required for families to receive any sort of medical insurance coverage for their services, that they have to have a medical professional, meaning an MD or a DO, sign off on, <clears throat> uh, on a diagnosis. Um, typically, it doesn't require require any sort of formal assessment measures, um, just like any of uh, a number of other diagnoses that you might make in your office. Uh, screeners are often helpful. Of course, the MCHAT is the most popular. I've got that link in here a couple of different times. Um, there's a couple of other there's the others there that sometimes are available, uh, and some some medical professionals choose to use. But those are those are again. This is I'm I'm telling you what you already know. A different type of assessment. Um, is going to be kind of the assessments that I tend to do. And these are psychological evaluations. Um, <clears throat> versus, a, 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 in contrast to a, a medical diagnosis that can happen in the course of one regular visit, a psychological evaluation typically takes uh, up to 10 clinical hours of face-to-face -face contact plus some additional um, data collection outside of that. Uh, we want to make sure that when we're doing a psychological evaluation for ASD, uh, we're looking both at developmental history and current presentation. Um, autism is what we call a historical diagnosis. So once somebody meets criteria for autism, they can carry that diagnosis for the remainder of their life. 
Uh, <clears throat> it does not require that they meet current criteria in order to qualify for the diagnosis. And I've worked with a couple of clinics here in town that specialize in the di late diagnosis of autism um, in, up to and including you know, uh, geriatric patients. Um, obviously, in many of those cases, if they've gotten to that stage in their life, they may not be meeting full diagnostic criteria, but they did at one point. And so if they did, they, they still qualify for this diagnosis and that can be uh, extremely helpful in them for them in terms of understanding um, themselves and how they're functioning and where some of their difficulties may have come from. Um, typically, in a psychological assessment of autism spectrum disorder, <clears throat> it will require um, some sort of a formal assessment measure. I uh, put an asterisk next to the ADOS 2 That is considered the gold standard measure. It is the one that holds up the best in all legal cases that I'm aware of. Um, it is uh, up to an hour long. It is a clinician-administered, semi-structured interaction. And what they do in this interaction is create what we call social presses. So we, we have different devices and toys and age-appropriate things that we can do with different kids, and there's different modules based on the age of the child um, <clears throat> or young adult or adult. And um, you know, for a very young child, maybe we'll do something like um, blow bubbles into the middle of the room. Um, there is no correct answer. There is no um, you know, scored response that the child will have, but we do watch closely. How does the child respond to those bubbles? Do they notice them? If they don't notice them, uh, what is it that they're distracted by? If they do notice them, how do they respond when the bubbles go away? Do they request more? Do they look to a caregiver? Do they look to us? Do they reach for the bubbles? How do they respond? In any one of those social interactions, we're not going to have enough information to make a diagnosis. But the ADOS includes you know, about 13 different interactions of different styles uh, over the course of that hour. And over the course of 13 of those different interactions, you can get some a real... Uh, clear impression of the, the ways that this child chooses to engage and, and socialize. And for that reason, this is really the gold standard measure. It's time consuming. It's an extremely expensive set of uh, a kit of devices, um, but it is still something that, that is uh, very well respected in the community. The accompanying measure is called the ADIR, the Autism Diagnostic Interview Revised, written by the same team. And this is a two and a half hour developmental semi-structured interview. Um, I wish I could say this was used widely, but it is not. At that kind of a time investment, it is simply too much for most clinicians to be able to include. Uh, but there is a measure out there that is kind of the gold standard in terms of a developmental history as well. Uh, so there's some other measures here that do um, some or all of those same types of assessments. We've got the CARS, the SRS, the SRS SCQ, for example. Typically, a psychological evaluation is going to include a full written report. Um, those, rec those will typically include the diagnostic compressions as well as some treatment recommendations where they think the child should go um, after this first initial evaluation. Um, and then follow-up evaluations, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, those initial evaluations, if they're private pay, are typically around $2,000. And I mentioned that um, because not all of our patients are able to provide that, that kind of a payment out of pocket, especially in a lump sum. Uh, insurance, uh, behavioral health insurance often does help. Um, I have some, some resources for anybody who's interested in them um, that I provide to many of my patients and ask them to contact their insurance company. Of course, you can't get a, a solid promise from any sort of insurance company, but you can get an impression of what coverages that particular plan includes, and they can get some idea of what's likely to be covered and what won't be. Um, luckily, follow-up evaluations, which we typically recommend every few years, are uh, somewhat cheaper because we won't need to do quite as many of the full diagnostic measures right off the bat. Um, it's important to also understand, especially when we're dealing with, with children, that there's, also, there's a different type of evaluation that happens in the school system. Um, and many people are somewhat confused by the differences between this evaluation and a psychological evaluation. Um, they typically call it an FIE, a full and individual evaluation, and it is not intended to be diagnostic. However, if they have access to a diagnostic report from a psychologist, they may choose to consider that, that documentation and, and include that in, what they're, uh, in their own evaluations. I underlined the word may there because the school district um, likes to operate in their own little world and in their own way. Um, they don't necessarily have to accept a diagnosis from a medical professional, from a psychologist, or from anyone else. Um, what they're looking for is something that is different than a diagnosis. What they're talking about is an is educational eligibility. Um, so again, we're used to a DSM or an, ID, uh, or an ICD that has you know, hundreds of different diagnoses and we're trying to find the one that best fits. An educational evaluation is only interested in the 13 IDEA eligibilities and whether or not this child demonstrates an academic or educational need 
in one of those categories. That is the only purpose of a school evaluation. Many, many families and professionals get confused when they say that a kid qualifies as having autism. That is not the same as a diagnosis. It is something that's quite different. Uh, and these are repeated every three years. I'm going to show you the 13 IDEA categories just so you have some idea of what we're looking at here. Um, you see autism is right there, alphabetically comes first. Uh, it's uh, one of the categories that you can qualify for special services. And if you look down this list, it's a pretty limited list. Um, there's deafness, there's emotional disturbance that covers a whole range of different conditions that we might diagnose, including PTSD, bipolar, anxiety, depression, um, lots of other things that might fall into that category. Hearing impairment, intellectual disability, which is again a very broad category multiple disabilities, um, they have specific learning disability, SLD or LD. Um, you'll notice that one kind of in the middle there that said other health impairment. Um, that's kind of their catch-all for anything else. Uh, there are some key words that they like to use in that particular category, and I mentioned that one specifically because uh, we see that a lot. It's actually where they categorize something like um, ADHD uh, because that there is, in their words, it affects the vitality, alertness, or um, ability to access the curriculum or something along those lines. I included a link here that has a great little description of each one of these and kind of helps you understand what it is that a school district is looking for. Um, but it's important to understand that somebody can qualify for an educational el eligibility in one category, but not a clinical diagnosis and vice versa. You, I can diagnose somebody with autism, but maybe their impairments don't affect their ability to participate in school to a degree that the school district would would agree to, uh, and qualify them as eligible excuse me for special education services and even though they acknowledge that there's a diagnosis it's not the same as an eligibility i hope that makes sense <clears throat> so i included several slides here on what does asd actually look like um, <clears throat> and I, one of the questions i get most often from physicians is how do i know when i've got autism in my office how do i know if that's what i'm looking at um, and so here's, I kind of went through the different diagnostic criteria and kind of gave some bullet points or some examples of situations and, and things that you might see during the course of an office visit. Um, I'm not going to read all of these to you again. You know, hopefully you'll have these slides and you can go through them on your own. I want to make sure that we have time to get to some good quality uh, Q&A at the end, um, but I will kind of summarize them briefly. Um, so basically, one of the things you're going to notice is less interest in people than would be expected. And again, I took that terminology from the diagnostic criteria. I don't love that terminology. In my experience, people with autism want to be or are as interested and want to be as connected to others as anyone else. They often don't know how to do that. They don't often understand how um, their behaviors may communicate disinterest, even if they don't intend to communicate disinterest. And in many cases, as they get older, they've had so many negative social experiences that they find it's just safer to withdraw and to not engage with other people. Um, it's kind of a self-protective movement instead of a, a lack of interest that, that is a genuine lack. Uh, but it does, for those of us that, that aren't inside their heads, does appear often as if they're disinterested or not, not wanting to be present or engage with other people. Um, the, you, you, if you're familiar with child development, you've heard a lot about the, the power of the point and the, you know, the finger extended point to express interest or, um, or distal attention directing um, is a very powerful gesture. And you'll see that that may be limited or absent in kids with autism. Um, you'll sh see less showing where they take something and hold it up so for someone else to inspect. Um, there's kind of a giveaway in perspective taking. So sometimes if somebody does hold something up, they'll hold it with the back of their hand in the way or something along those lines, not really able to take the perspective and understand that you can't see what I can see. Um, you might see a lack of a social smile. And as you know, social smiles can happen you know, in the delivery room. You can see very, very young children um, that can do that and smile and just in reflexive response to seeing a smile. Um, and kids with ASD may not do that to the same degree. You'll see difficulty starting conversations and interactions, um, and if they can start them, you might have difficulty keeping them going, especially if they don't re revolve around that special interest. Um, they're gonna tolerate you know, uh, certain interactions usually on their own terms sometimes, um, but you'll really notice something, some reduced uh, enjoyment sharing. So you'll notice that you know, if they find something that they find interesting or exciting or fun, there's a natural human response, especially for young children, to quickly look to their caregiver or look to the person that's with them. Like, do you see what I'm seeing? This is great. I want to see this. And I want to see what your reaction to this is. Uh, and they really want to have that shared experiment of experience of enjoyment together with someone. Uh, you might see that absent or missing um, from somebody with autism. You might have a delay in spoken language. 
um, but you may not. So uh, that's, uh, that's not a, um, it's not required for the diagnosis. Let me click through here. Um, we're learning more and more about the importance of various gestures and how limited that can be in the population of individuals with autism, that they simply use fewer gestures. Um, you'll see there that it says may or may not make good eye contact. I certainly have worked with individuals who qualify for an autism diagnosis who do make excellent eye contact. Um, that doesn't necessarily, and I hear this a lot, and the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing that point is I have worked with a number of families who have said, well, I've, been, I've wondered for a long time what was going on with my child, but I was told that he couldn't have autism because he makes eye contact. Um, and that's just simply not true. You can make eye contact and also have autism. Uh, you may notice that their sense of humor seems uh, disconnected or out of touch with the people around them. There we go. Um, one of the things that sets autism apart from other diagnoses is this restricted range of interests and, and uh, repetitive behaviors. You might see that their speech is repetitive or their body movements, and this is some of the more quote-unquote classic autism. Um, this is where you might see things like flapping or um, spinning or jumping. You might hear echolalia where they're repeating the same things exactly um, in the same ways over and over again, sometimes from a video, often YouTube or a movie of their, their choosing, um, those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice this big one at the bottom here that says more interested in parts of objects than the whole. So if you give them a toy car, they may take that car, flip it right upside down and start spinning one of the tires. Just noticing that, that spinning motion and staring at that rather than considering the whole toy as a car and driving it around in a way that we would consider more, uh, more expected. And of course, we do have some sensory differences in this population. We have um, just, they have a, a genuine, genuinely different sensory experience that can be hypo or hypersensitive in any way. Um, so again, I can't say, oh, it looks like this because it can be um, both extremes in every one of these. You know, somebody who covers their ears and protects themselves from, from sounds that the rest of us either don't notice or don't, don't bother us. Um, to kids that are constantly making noise and seeking out sounds and listening closely to things that um, that other people don't enjoy listening to. <clears throat> One of my favorite things to ask families about when I'm doing this diagnostic interview um, is how do they respond to you know, routines and violations of, to that routine? Um, if they get really upset when their routines or their patterns are disrupted, that can be kind of an indicator that maybe there's something else going on here other than just, you know, typical development. Um, folks with autism, one of the original diagnostic criteria all the way back in the 1940s with Leo Connor um, was the, what he called it an autistic need for sameness. Um, and he just, you know, they, they are resistant to change really of any kind and they don't like things to be different. They like to be able to know what to expect. They like to know what, what's coming. Um, more than the rest of us. I think we all like that to some extent. Um, <clears throat> but this is extra extra true for them as well. You might see them uh, arranging objects or toys in a certain way, sometimes in a straight line, uh, rather than playing with those. And they might become very upset if they're not left that way. Um, <clears throat> you might see them being interested in, in different things. If they are verbal, uh, you might see them talking about the same topics over and over and over again. Um, and it's, you know, it's typical for kids to have areas of interest, um, but these are interests that are unusual uh, in their content or in their degree. So I have had, I've worked with young children uh, that were interested in toilets, for example, or uh, mustard commercials. It was actually Grey Poupon commercials specifically that that particular little boy uh, was interested in. Have you seen the commercial where, and it would kind of, that was one of his favorite things to talk about. Uh, I once knew a little boy who could tell you all the part numbers of every Dyson vacuum cleaner that had ever been made. Um, that's just an unusual thing for a child to know or be, you know, be interested in. Um, but I've also seen kids that are interested in things that are completely typical for other children to be interested in, but they do it in a, in a, to a degree that is unusual. Um, <clears throat> so a kid can like the color green, for example, but I once knew a, a little boy who would have an absolute kicking and screaming meltdown if he was asked to wear a shirt of any color other than green. Um, so that's an, that's an intense interest in, in color that's unusual in its severity. Um, I've seen, you know, Thomas the Tank Engine, of course, a very popular interest for young children. But I've also seen, you know, kids at 12 years old still dressing up as Thomas for Halloween uh, and things like that. And that's pretty unusual for them. Um, <clears throat> I've put some pictures in here as well, um, not to single these out. These are just from the Creative Commons um, searches. 
Uh, but just to kind of give you some of the things that you might notice, I mean, what, is, what are about these pictures pops out to us as, as professionals? Uh, the little boy in the middle is probably my easiest example. I, I don't know many children who would find entertainment um, stacking the canned goods out of the pantry. Uh, that does appear to be what he's doing. And if that happened one time, I would be, oh, that's unusual. Uh, but I have a feeling that this is not an unusual pattern behavior for this little boy. Um, the boy on the top left is looking at the, the parts of the toy. He's not playing with toys as they're intended. Um, the, the picture at the top right, you can see that that young man is is trying to engage, but <laughs> look at his poor father who's not really seeming to enjoy that <laughs> enjoy that contact as much. And you know, he's the the little boy seems to be trying to connect in a way that just doesn't seem to to connect. It doesn't seem to work as well for the other people. Um, the gentleman in the bottom left has got some interesting posturing. Um, he noticed that he's not looking at the camera. Those are some things that uh, that you might notice in your office. Uh, and the young man in the bottom right has got a hold of that. I think that's a rubber band or something he's got that's clearly his his focus. And I, in my mind, I make up the story um, that he's looking at me just to make sure I don't mess with whatever it is that he's got because uh, he wants to protect his his little thing. Those are just some ideas and, and trying to put some visualization uh, into some of the things I'm describing here. Um, we did talk about sensory interests, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this um, because I could spend uh, the whole day if I needed to. Um, but children with autism often have that over under sensitivity that can produce actual mild discomfort. You know, if I were to turn on uh, sound the fire alarm in your offices right now, many of us would instinctively have to cover our ears or protect ourselves from what we consider a, a physically painful sensation. Um, there's considerable research to show that kids on the autism spectrum have just different thresholds. Uh, things that we don't even really notice or bother us might cause that same level of discomfort on a regular basis. And if you can imagine trying to go through um, a, a school day or a social interaction with a fire alarm blaring repeatedly in your ears, it would be really difficult. And so it's, it kind of puts it in this, a different um, perception or different, different understanding of what they might be going through. Um, and I put this in bold, many children exhibit unwanted behavior due to a sensory deficit or need. Um, uh, uh, I wouldn't say... I wouldn't say that it's the vast majority, but I would say many, many times parents come into my office with problematic behaviors and they're looking for help. Um, one of the first things, and, and they, this is the, the thing that gives you the reputation as being the magician that can solve any problem, um, is looking for that sensory component, looking for what it is that's actually upsetting that child and, that, uh, and what they might be responding to that other people haven't noticed. Um, and if you can modify that or protect them from that, in, that input, um, all of a sudden that you find you know, dramatic changes in behavior, and that can be really, really powerful. Um, <clears throat> so the, the million dollar question, how do I be sure I catch it? How do I make sure that when somebody comes through my office that I'm, I'm seeing what I need to see? Um, <clears throat> the best answer I can give is to screen. Um, you know, we, as I mentioned before, the MCHAT R is the most, uh, most popular, most commonly used. Um, there's lots of, of different ones out there. Um, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and you'll notice uh, that I tend to really uh, prefer going with mainstream science, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get going here. Um, but the, the AAP is recommending screening at 18 or 24 months. The MCHAT R can be used a little before and a little after that if needed, uh, if you have questions or just still aren't sure. Uh, it's important to mention that there are some relevant legal precedents that are being set here where um, physicians are being found guilty of malpractice for not screening appropriately, uh, for missing um, signs. And so I don't mean to, to throw that out there to be uh, a threat or to scare anyone, but it's it does seem important to understand that that this is becoming a more, an increasing expectation that we're doing this if you're not already. Um, one thing that I really want to make sure that, that all physicians hear is that research is showing that maternal concern, when a mom says something isn't right or something's wrong, um, that that is statistically a better and more reliable um, indicator of, of, a diff, of a problem with development than any other tools we have, including clinical impression, including teacher reports, including uh, standardized assessment measures. Uh, it is the most reliable indicator that something's going on. Um, and I can't tell you how many hundreds of families I've worked with where the, the mom says, I've been telling my doctor for years that something wasn't right, but they didn't think they said he'd grow out of it or he's a boy or he's a late bloomer or any of these different um, answers that they've gotten. Um, and I just you know, if I can give one piece of advice, it's listen closely to those mothers. Now, unfortunately, 
The inverse is not also true, meaning that if a mom says nothing is wrong, it doesn't mean that nothing is wrong. You may be noticing something before the family does, uh, and that's still, that, is, that is still relatively common. But when that mom says something's wrong and you're not seeing it, uh, try and get them, try and understand what it is that they're noticing. See what it is that they're connected to. I realize that you guys probably see um, dozens of anxious mothers a day. Um, and everybody's worried that the worst is true with their, with their child. But when they're worried about the social communication, that that's something I would really uh, key on and, and try and, and understand as well as you possibly can. Um, I do often ask, um, have any teachers or professionals um, expressed any concerns about your child's development? Um, those are kind of a front line of defense. If you think about a, pop, a profession that sees you know, hundreds and hundreds of typically developing children, on a regular basis, they're going to notice when somebody doesn't stick to that uh, to that realm of normal. I once heard a physician refer to the broad range of normal, and I love that term because, of course, development is not linear; it's not consistent from individual to individual. Uh, but those those preschool teachers see hundreds of children, and they see the, they they know when someone is outside of that range. They know when someone doesn't fit inside that um, that range of normal. <clears throat> um, all right, and so if you suspect ASD might be present, you know, further evaluation is really just going to be your best bet. Check my time. Okay, we're doing well. Um, I'm going to include this link. Pediatrics just released this in January of 2020. Um, it is an excellent resource. It's a very long uh, clinical report um, that I would say if you follow these, these steps, um, you'll be doing better than 95% of the medical professionals out there in terms of being able to provide support and guidance for uh, individuals on the spectrum. <clears throat> um, so again, this is this is just a, a, an excellent guide for pediatricians in terms of what they're looking for, what what they should be uh, preparing families for, resources, those sorts of things. Uh, just to note, because I have to fit it in somewhere <laughs> that uh, that we have this discussion, um, the vaccines. And I wish um, I, I wish I could could make this clearer than I have. Um, but we can simply say that vaccines have been scientifically ruled out as a cause for ASD. Um, if you're interested in any more of my, my soapbox in terms of, uh, of why that's true, if, uh, I'm happy to have that conversation with any of you back channel or an email or anything like that. Um, we'll suffice it to say that there have been a number of studies. Um, the best example of which I can pull is the Taylor Sword Figure and Eslick study from 2014. It was a meta-analysis of 10 different studies uh, involving a total of 1.2 million children. And statistically, they were able to show that no relationship between vaccination and ASD, no relationship between M the MMR vaccine specifically and ASD, no relation be between thymosorol, which is, of course, the preservative in the MMR vaccine that is supposed to uh, contain mercury and, and be related, uh, and ASD, and no relationship between mercury, blood mercury levels and ASD. In fact, uh, the study found that the number of vaccines before age two and within a short period of time did not increase risk. And I realize that professionals and pediatricians are having to make some difficult decisions right now in terms of who you're willing to see in your clinic. I hear clinics all over Houston that say we will not see you unless you follow our recommended vaccination schedule versus uh, other folks that say, you know, if, they, if they're not in my office, I can't help them at all. So I will work with them and, and you know, with the vaccines, but, you know, any vaccines are better than none kind of an, an attitude. So um, that's up to the university system and, and the regulations where you are. Uh, but I do, I, I do want to just have said that so that when you have parents ask, because you will get parents that ask, um, <clears throat> that we just, we don't have any evidence that those are related. Okay. So here's where the, the process gets a little bit more uh, personal. It, it touches us a little bit deeper. Um, so you've got a child in your office. You think it's ASD. So what do you do next? And this is, this is a key moment in this child and in this family's life. I want you to just take a moment to imagine. For those of you that have children, um, to, to picture the idea, like in this picture, of, of having that baby um, and all the hopes and dreams that you have for that child and, you know, what you what you expect and you know being concerned and to hear something like the a word the autism word about your little baby um what that would do to you emotionally how you would respond to that i mean it is an ex incredibly powerful moment in my experience once parents hear the word autism the rest of that visit is a blur to them they're not hearing another word um, from you for that period of time and so it's important to to understand that and to be as supportive as possible. I do recommend using the term. The number of families that use 
um, the little turns of phrase that we use to make things an easier conversation to hide from the truth and be in denial uh, is many, many, many. Uh, if they don't hear the word autism, they, they think it's not it's not that. It's like that, but it's not that. And I hear that a lot. Um, but I do just kind of want to take a moment to think about that experience from the parent perspective and to try and make sure that we're being as supportive um, and as, as helpful as we can possibly be in, throughout that process. Um, I've heard of everything from physicians writing ASD, the letters ASD on a prescription pad and handing it to the mom to, you know, fully supportive. And I really want to make sure that we kind of fall into that, that latter category as much as possible. Um, so one of the first things that we can do is start to provide some support for that family. Um, I think it, as soon as you think it's ASD, it's time to build that team. Uh, and ASD is very much the it takes a village intervention. We, and we're going to have lots of different people who are going to be involved. Uh, I've listed them here, a psychologist, speech language pathologist, occupational and physical therapist, behaviorist, school personnel. I put medical spe specialists on here with a question mark, but I'm going to recommend that, that, that there are at least a couple of referrals that pretty much every family is going to get in different combinations. Uh, that can include genetics, neurology, GI, nutrition, um, psychiatry, developmental pediatrics, ENT, um, depending on the age of the patient, you can do gynecology, you can do, uh, I mean, just any any number of, of specific um, referrals that may be related to other problems that are going on. And I just want to make sure that we have those people as part of the team. <clears throat> so what do the different professions contribute? How do we all fit together? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as I mentioned before, psychologists are going to do kind of a formal diagnostic assessment. I think that's a great place for people to start. Um, not only does that usually there's going to be a wait time before they can get in for that evaluation. It gives them a little bit of a chance to kind of digest the idea of autism, um, but it gives a more complete evaluation. Um, it allows them to spend those several hours with a professional asking all the questions about where, you know, did they do this when they were little? Did they point? Did they talk late? Tell me all of the information. Tell me everything I can learn. Uh, about this kid's development to be sure, to be absolutely positive that we're dealing with autism uh, as much as we can be. Uh, and then they can also be in the right spot to get some um, family therapy or support or social skills or whatever it is that they're going to need for that child right there at the psychologist. Um, <clears throat> typically, if there is a language delay, that psychologist is going to be the one that's going to start making some of those referrals to things like speech and language pathologists. And that speech and language testing is a different entity. It's similar but different from what the, the psychologist is going to do. Um, but they can also begin speech therapy. And I think that there's often misconceptions about what speech therapy can do. Um, speech therapy is a remarkably ver versatile tool. Um, they can do um, work with oral motor skills where they're actually changing the way that people use their mouths to make sounds and and, um, and to speak. They can do social pragmatics, who and when to, to greet in certain ways, how to ask questions, how to respond to questions, how to um, <clears throat> socially kind of get along in different social situations. Uh, they can do, you know, swallowing and feeding. They can do um, aphasia where someone just can't remember the right words to use in a certain situation or word recall problems. Um, these interventions can be individual, dyadic, group, whatever that, that therapist thinks is going to be best for, for that child. So that's a really useful place for a lot of families to start. And it's also one of the ones that is best covered by insurance. And that's just a, a good place for people to start getting some, some help. Occupational therapy is another intervention that's very, very common. Uh, they tend to do a lot of work with fine motor skills, development. They can also do some feeding therapy. Um, but sensory integration is a big part of what many occupa occupational therapists do. And that includes both the ability to tolerate sensations that are um, <clears throat> unpleasant or, or difficult for them to tolerate, as well as finding socially appropriate ways to seek out those sensations that, they're, that they'd like to get more of. I mean, I've had children who um, are sensitive to smells and really just go around seeking out different smells. They'll smell people's hair, or their skin, looking for lotion or shampoo or different things that they can smell. And of course, socially, that can cause some problems for that kiddo. So how can we help them get that, that physiological need met uh, in a way that's not going to cause them some social problems. Um, that can be a really, a really excellent tool to have as well. Um, similarly, you have a, a physical therapist that tend to be more focused on the gross motor skills and core development, strength, those sorts of things. Uh, you see a disrupted gait or an unusual gait in a lot of these kids, and that's just kind of one, um, one element of the physical therapy that they can work on. Um, you'll hear <clears throat> behaviorist, behavior analyst, BCBA, which stands for Board Certified Behavior Analyst, um, 
behavior therapists. There's a lot of different terminology that they'll use for this. Uh, ABA therapists, uh, applied behavior analysis therapists. Um, it's important for me to kind of spend a moment talking about this um, because there, if you look in, in you know the manual of empirically supported treatments, the only thing you're going to find in there is this ABA, the behavioral intervention. Um, and statistically, and according to research, we do see that there are a lot of kids that benefit from these interventions. Where I get a little bit stuck and where I want to have people making um, wise decisions and smart referrals is, uh, you know, a behavior analyst, um, th they can do certain things. They can build skills, they can teach rote skills, um, they can develop um, language, they can develop uh, you know, how to tie your shoes, how to get dressed, lots of different things. They can actually even help get, get rid of problematic behavior and replace it with more uh, socially appropriate behavior. But it is not a blanket treatment for all kids with autism. And because it's the only thing listed under the empirically uh, supported interventions, uh, there's a, kind of a misperception that it is, that everybody with autism must get ABA. Uh, there is such a thing as too much ABA. You can teach kids... Um, and honestly, the, the behavioral science behind what they do is similar to what they use for animal training. Um, it's, you know, reward and consequences. It's teaching things, you know, to, if you do the right thing, here's your little treat uh, kind of a strategy. And it works very, very well in a lot of ways. But what it doesn't do is teach kids to think flexibly, to apply their um, information in social settings, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, and you can get kids that have spent too much time in, in ABA that become prompt dependent. Or they won't do things without the proper prompt. Um, or where they become robotic in the way that they interact, and it, it kind of loses even more of that social um, and, and you know, dynamic experience that we're used to having with other people. Uh, of course, there's the school personnel, which have offer a <coughs> um, functional academics that got cut off there, but it, educational assessment, functional academic, social skills. Um, the school is actually equipped to provide some of these other skills, uh, these other interventions as well, uh, speech therapy, occupational therapy, those sorts of things. It's important to understand that when a school says they're going to offer speech therapy, typically they're talking about two or three hours per semester or month, not per week. Uh, and that's what you're typically going to find on the, the private interventions. And so that's it's a great supplement, but it's not necessarily a replacement if the family has the resources to be able to do private therapy. All right. So as physicians, as medical professionals, what is your role? How do you fit in? And of course, in, in, a, in addition to being critical to that early identification question that we've talked about, um, really, I see uh, primary physicians as being key in terms of helping families to develop their treatment plan in kind of that case management, um, to know what's worth pursuing in terms of interventions. You've got all those choices of things that they can do, uh, but what what does that mean? What, what are they, um, how do they choose? You know, they, there's only a finite amount of hours in the week and, and dollars in the bank to be able to fund all those sorts of things. So how do we, how do we decide? Um, and I think that that's where a physician can be very helpful. Like, okay, so this kid's primary need, the most important thing they have is X. Uh, maybe it's language development, maybe it's uh, behavior modification, maybe it's um, skill development, maybe it's social skills. You know, but you can help them kind of identify, this is where this kid needs the most help. Um, I do want to throw out there, there's an entire presentation I can give on this, this one topic, uh, but that wandering and elopement is an often overlooked threat. It's actually um, interesting. Drowning is one of the leading causes of death for, for children with autism. Uh, and typically that happens when a child leaves an area where they're supposed a supervised area where they're supposed to be. Um, just sometimes they wander away from home. Sometimes they're going to go to the neighborhood lake or the pool. Uh, but there is a, a connection with kids and, and autism in the sensory experience of, of water. And so it, we, we joke it's like a moth to flame. They just find the, whatever body of water they can find. Um, and often that's the, those, those stories end in tragedy. And so it's important to talk with families about the dangers of wandering and elopement from a very young age. Uh, this is a relatively new bullet on my slide here. I've not, uh, not had to include this in the past. But I have heard an increasing number of parents come in and tell me, oh, I know he's not talking or I know he's socially delayed, but it's just COVID. It's because he's not in school. I have some problems with that. Um, you know, developmentally, kids were developing and learning to talk long before there was such a thing as school uh, and before they were spending as much time in school as they do now. Um, so to me, COVID-19 does not explain in quarantine and those sorts of things, does not explain or justify social delays, but I'm hearing that more and more from families. 
Um, and so, the, you know, oh, he, he's not talking because, you know, he's not around as many kids. Well, he's still hearing language, and it's still something that would be expected to be developing normally, um, even if they are hearing less language or they're spending more time on uh, screens or something like that because of the quarantine. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to ask for a copy of any treatment goals. If they are in ABA therapy or they are in speech, ask for a copy of those goals, not the whole intervention. You don't need all of that. Um, but take a look at what it is they're working on. And the reason for that is that you're uniquely qualified to be looking for alternative explanations for what might be going on. Um, and I can I have an almost unlimited list of uh, examples that I can put in here. Um, but, you know, um, I've worked with kids who were on these intensive behavioral programs where they're rewarding and punishing based on uh, toilet training. The kid's having trouble toilet training and maybe they're four years old and the parents are just distraught and they're you know, so ready to be done with diapers and all those sorts of things. Uh, well, uh, one of those children had an intestinal blockage. He actually had no control over his bowels. Um, and that was, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that this kid was on this reward and punishment scale because he didn't know, he, he couldn't help it. Uh, he was nonverbal and not able to express that very well. And that was, uh, was something to, to be aware of. Uh, but, you know, headbanging can be sinus infections. Uh, response to name can be hearing uh, sleep disruptions and emotional dysregulation, that can be seizure activity. I mean, there could be any number of things. And again, as medical professionals, you're far more equipped to notice things like, mm, maybe that's not just a behavior. Maybe there's something medical going on here that this kid needs uh, to be checked out for. And I always uh, like to rule out medical causes before I initiate any sort of behavioral treatment, um, just to be sure that I'm, there isn't, a, one, a quicker fix. You know, if you have a uh, a medication or an intervention that you can do medically that'll solve the problem, that's a lot better than these behavioral interventions in many cases. Uh, but two, I don't want to be punishing a kid or rewarding a kid for something outside of their control because that just teaches them some of the, the wrong lessons. Um, <clears throat> I kind of mentioned the, you know, imagine what it's like to be a parent going through this experience. Once they've had the opportunity to grieve, it's important to understand that these parents experience more parental stress than any other clinical group. Um, and that's a remarkable thing to say. That, that study included terminal illnesses, it included um, severe intellectual disabilities, people who we know have a, a pretty poor outcome uh, and prognosis. The, the reason that they believe that the parental stress is actually higher for this population is because the, the prognosis is so unclear. We have yet to find what indicators are going to tell us whether this kid's going to grow up to be independent and successful or not. Um, with the general population, we have some handy built-in indicators, right? Um, you know, IQ provides somewhat of a reasonable estimate of outcome. Um, if you have a, a higher IQ, up to a, an apparent limit of around 120 points, um, your, your outcome is better. You tend to have higher uh, educational attainment. The higher your educational attainment, the higher your employment uh, and your ACS, ultimately, as an adult. Um, <clears throat> and that's a pretty interesting finding. With ASD we find that that plateau happens around 70, meaning if you have a bare minimum of intellectual capacity, um, you, you, you don't know what it is that's gonna predict. It's not IQ anymore. You can have a 120 and your outcome may not be better than that kiddo with 75. Uh, and that's a, that's a scary thing for parents to understand is that I don't know how to help prepare them because it's not the usual thing. Uh, and so because of that, we find that these families are so much more vulnerable to the snake oil salesmen and the non-mainstream interventions that are out there. They, um, they, they're just a, a prime population. They're, they're desperate, they're stressed, they want the best for their child, they don't know how to get it. And so if someone comes along offering this uh, too good to be true intervention, it's really tempting in a lot of cases. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those in, in a minute. Um, and actually, I think the slides are kind of out of place. It's supposed to be later in the presentation. But um, I did talk a little bit already about uh, being selective with your referrals. You know, not all treatments designed for people with ASD will be appropriate for all individuals with ASD is kind of the idea. Uh, because it's such a broad range of functioning, you really need to individualize the referrals. Um, and if you're not comfortable making those referrals, to develop a, a, a team of, uh, that includes a psychologist who you think can. Um, you know, some of these interventions, particularly the behavioral interventions, can be up to 40 hours a week for these little guys. Um, not only is that expensive, but I mean, it takes everything that that family has to get them there and to make sure they've got all the, you know, uh, transportation and the supports and all the things that they're going to need. Um, and if they're having to pay for that and uh, on top of insurance, you know, that's uh, just huge, huge investment of time and resources. And it's important to understand that just because it says ASD equals ABA in the... Um, 
empirically supported treatment manual. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that's true for everybody. All right, so here's a list of some mainstream interventions just to know what's out there. Um, these are categorical. I'm going to kind of speed up here because I know I'm almost out of time and I want to be sure we have time for Q&A. Um, behavioral interventions, I've already given my, my asterisk uh, spiel on that, so I won't do that again. Sometimes those are called ABA or verbal behavior. Uh, language and communication interventions include the speech therapy I was talking about earlier. Assistive technology is a growing field. Um, it's important to understand that this is um, different than the augmented communication that we've had in the past, which is where an adult actually helps them to communicate. Um, we've learned that, that that's been debunked as, as uh, not scientifically supported, that the, the adult was doing the communicating in too many cases. Uh, physical occupational therapy, which has a lot more, more of those balanced body strength, sensory components. Um, social skills um, can be groups. Social stories are a great strategy. Social stories, also known as informational stories, um, are like homemade children's books where you talk about real life experiences. So I've made them for the airport, for example, um, before a child takes their first trip in an airplane. Um, talking about this is where we're going to check in and get our tickets. This is where we're going to wait in line before we go through security. And when we go through security, they're going to ask us these questions. And these are the things that we can say. Those sorts of things so that they can kind of have that script and routine already established before they ever set foot in the airport. Um, that works for any sort of uh, of areas, and I've done a lot of them for medical procedures and dental procedures, so that's something to be aware of that might be a helpful tool for some of your families. Of course, psychological interventions. Um, I do want to mention the cognitive and developmental interventions. I put these under mainstream interventions despite the fact that they lack some of the empirical support. Uh, the reason they lack some empirical support is that they're very tough to research. Uh, I, as you heard in my bio, I worked for the developers of the RDI program uh, here in Houston for a while. Um, I've been been exposed to and worked with uh, each of these different models, and their their attempt is to work on the actual cognitive developmental proceed or processes, um, and meet the child where their developmental level is, not necessarily where their chronological level is, um, and help them to continue to develop and build skills in ways that work well for them. Um, there's been some preliminary evidence that things look like they can be very very effective. Um, unfortunately, each of these programs is extremely expensive and they don't tend to be covered by insurance. So that's just something to know about them. All right, so for interventions that are lacking support, I put four ASD underline because of course these are supported for other situations, um, but we have all sorts of interventions out there that just simply don't have the empirical support at this point. They have great testimonials, they have, they have wonderful advertising materials in some cases, but they simply don't have the empirical support. Uh, barometric chambers is one I've seen. Um, I've even seen some wealthy families put barometric chambers in their own home so that they can put their child in there. I'm not sure even what the proposed method of change <laughs> is for a barometric chamber, uh, but that's not been supported. Restricted diets. Now, we do know that kids on the autism spectrum um, tend to have more gastrointestinal differences. Uh, what we don't know is the clinical significance of some of those dif differences. Um, so restricted diets are not to say that they can't use them for ASD. It's just that it's not a blanket intervention. Uh, the gluten-free, casein-free being the most popular one that I see, but there's others. Um, it, there are certainly children where that it, that a special or restricted diet is beneficial for them, but I would uh, encourage that to be under the guidance of a nutritionist or somebody uh, rather than just because the kid has the autism, let's try the diet kind of a thing. I've seen stem cell inje injections. I've seen mega doses of vitamins. I've seen uh, antivirals. I've seen chelation as a, an ongoing thing where we actually have documented cases of children dying from lack of potassium and iron and you know key uh, heavy metals that their body actually needs that the chelating agents were removing from their system. So it's just important to know that the, those interventions don't have the proper support yet to be encouraged. Um, here's some risks of intervention. I don't need to go through these. I think you guys as medical professionals can can summarize these, not just loss of uh, resources and the, the medical harm, but uh, the family disagreement. Man, the number of families I've worked with where um, the family argues about the financial burden or that I don't think we should do this or I do think we should do this, um, it's it's it takes quite a toll. Um, there's some resources here. I'm going to make sure that you'll have these slides so you can look at these. The Autism Speaks website um, has some political resistance. There are people who are unhappy with it because they do treat autism as a condition that needs to be treated. Uh, and there are people who um, are proud of their autism and wish that they would just be respected as such. And that's one of the main criticisms of Autism Speaks. But it is a great resource. There is a, something called the 100-Day Kit, 
um, that is supposed to be for the first 100 days following a diagnosis. That is an excellent tool for families who are coming to grips with that diagnosis for the first time. Um, those tools are translated into many languages and they're written for all sorts of different people. There's one for grandparents and for neighbors and for siblings and for uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so they're very, very useful toolkits they have on there. Um, the Autism Society of Texas is a great source for um, support groups for parents and psychoeducation. Uh, family to Family Network, and the, these examples of the local mental health authorities are here in Houston. Those are the Harris Center and Texana, but I'm sure that there are others uh, where you are that you can be aware of as well. Um, <clears throat> so this is, again, I'm just trying to run through these sort, same sort of thing. The local school districts can provide those evaluations, like I mentioned, uh, but realize that those are a little bit different. They can also provide counseling as a related service, uh, and some of that speech therapy and things like that, and then local mental health authority again. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Uh, I've got a, just a couple more slides here that talk about things you can do in your office to kind of help make things a little bit more um, friendly and, and easier for, for kids on the spectrum. Um, but I will, I will save that and just skip kind of straight to the, um, to the questions and answers period. And I can stay on for a few minutes after the, the one o'clock marker if you have time, but I want to be respectful of your time as well. All right, I am going to go ahead and um, ask a couple questions and then I will post the QR code. So the first question I have um, is thoughts on evaluation of possible treatment for inattention and hyperactivity in a patient with a known cause of ASD, known case, excuse me, of ASD. So uh, great question. Autism and ADHD co-occur at an incredibly high rate, and I don't remember the actual statistic, but I want to say it's in the ballpark of 60%. Um, so we're seeing a lot of the same executive functioning deficits in autism that you might see in ADHD. Um, up until the most recent DSM, they were actually mutually exclusive. You were not able to diagnose both in the same child. Now you can. Um, <clears throat> but it, uh, you're asking the, the right questions there. You know, Do we have enough of... Uh, of the inattention, the hyperactivity, enough of the symptoms of ADHD beyond what you would see in, in the impairments of, of autism um, to qualify for a secondary, a second diagnosis. Uh, I, that's that, you know, the million dollar question. Um, you, you, my, my suggestion would be to go to a psychologist for, for asking those sorts of things because we do have specialized measures that look specifically for ADHD symptoms versus the executive functioning deficits um, that, are in, in, that are present in both. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, one can look like the other and vice versa. Dr. Munford, this is a medication question, so I'm not sure um, how you feel about answering it. What is your opinion on the use of Respiradol for ASD behavior symptoms since it's the only FDA approved medicine for these symptoms? I, I'm not a medical professional. Disclaimers all over the place in terms of that, but I, I certainly have been asked that question a lot before. Um, <clears throat> on a case-by-case -case basis, um, I, I would... I have seen it be effective. I've seen it make major improvements, especially in terms of aggression uh, for folks on the autism spectrum. One of the biggest challenges is managing the weight gain that goes with Risperdal. Um, honestly, to answer that question fully, I would directly direct you to uh, Taiwo Babathope, who is a psychiatrist in my department um, who specializes in psychopharmacology of autism, and she would be your, your best bet. I can give you her contact information. And um, for folks on here, if your CPAN team also has three child psychiatrists on board, we can support you with that information as well. Um, and the last question, and if anybody wants to add any more, great. The last question I have here is preferred or excuse me, preferred or recommended assistive technology tools for communication, especially for kids with severe language impairment. <clears throat> so that's going to be, a, a, again, a very individualized answer. Um, I would defer to a speech and language pathologist who is very comfortable and proficient with assistive technology. Um, I have seen everything from a, just a regular iPad with um, a certain app put on it to actual specifically dedicated devices. Um, the, the, what that hinges on to me is the, the nature of the language disorder. Is it something where this person has an oral motor deficit where they're actually unable to make the sounds uh, clearly or easily and where communicating verbally um, is significantly more effortful for them than it would be through the device. Um, and in, in those cases, you know, whatever device is going to help them, um, <clears throat> whatever device is going to help them the best is going to be your best bet. But again, a, a speech and language pathologist is going to be who I would ask that question to. Um, and in some cases, what I've found in most cases actually is that once they're provided with the device that the kid finds that's way more work than just learning to say the things out loud. And eventually they start to speak without using the device because it's simply simpler. 
Uh, but <clears throat> All righty, I'm going to ask one more question here and then I will post the QR code. Thoughts on doing a trial of ADHD medication in low dose to see if it works in cases suspected to have coexisting ADD and ADHD? Um, just like any population, I think you the the risks and benefits are uh, are pretty self-explanatory. We, you know, we've been using stimulant medication, for example, uh, for quite some time. Um, and again, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not super comfortable in saying you know uh, whether I would would say that's a great thing to do or not. I have certainly seen cases where ADHD, ADHD medication made a huge difference for someone who would also had a diagnosis of ASD. Um, you know, we know stimulants do things like uh, boost test taking and things like that across populations. Uh, but in these cases, what you know, what we found is, in some cases, it can be a, a big help for both um, the ADHD symptoms and even for the executive functioning symptoms that are uh, that are present with ASD. Great. Thank you, Dr. Monfort. I'm not able to see the questions to see if there are any others that have been added because I did post the QR code. Let me scroll here. Okay. Hi, I wanted to ask a question. Sure. Hi, um, uh, I'm a counselor, I'm a professional counselor, and um, I've just seen a lot more teens that have gone undiagnosed. Um, so I've referred them out to a psychologist, uh, but uh, do you know what the prevalence is for teens with female teens that are undiagnosed um, till about their early 20s or late 18, 19 age range? Um, no, I mean, prevalence data on undiagnosed conditions is obviously very difficult to come by. Um, I can give you my anecdotal experience there. And, uh, you know, we know that autism occurs in uh, four times, four to one, and what's more common in uh, in males. Um, however, we also know that when we do identify a female, she tends to also have a lot more uh, intellectual impairments and be more severely affected. What that suggests to me is that the way that we socialize our boys and our girls is somewhat different, um, and that girls are often socialized from a much younger age and that in, in a way that masks some of those symptoms. And unless they're severely affected, we don't notice them until they're older. Um, I think that there is a very um, significant percentage of girls who probably meet diagnostic criteria, but who have masked it with some social skills and with their, their social su support network in a way that most professionals won't identify them. Uh, and you really do need to find someone who specializes not just in the diagnosis of autism, but in the diagnosis of autism in older children and young adults. And there aren't many of us out there um, that are doing that work. I do know several here in Houston. Uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. Catherine Loveland in our class clinic here in our department. Um, who is an internationally respected expert in that particular field. Um, and she's trained many of us, myself included, in terms in terms of how to look for those things. And it's honestly, it's it's a little bit more um, art than science at this point, because if you just go strictly through diagnostic criteria, you may not catch everybody. Um, there really does seem to be a different cognitive style, uh, way of interacting with the world and with information that you can identify if you know to ask the right questions. But it's it's a much more complicated task than you're going to be able to do in a, med in a reg regular medical visit. Uh, and in those cases, I, I, I wish I could give you a, um, a statistic of some sort, but I can tell you I certainly do see what you're seeing. I see lots of people that fall into that category, particularly our young girls. Thank you for that. Um, any suggested approaches? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do CBT or if they have a lot of trauma histories, which at least these particular uh, teens or young adults have. I'm treating it from a trauma perspective, but I, I sort of feel like I'm taking two steps forward and three back because then I go into like social cues and safety and things like that. Yes. Um, you. It sounds like you're doing it right then. <laughs> that sounds like what I would recommend. Um, Dr. Loveland, again, um, was is known for saying that sometimes doing therapy with uh, especially adults on the spectrum uh, is a little bit like hunting zebras, is how she says it. Um, sometimes you're just hiding in the bushes waiting for something to come along that you can use. Uh, and that's, that is often the case that I find is where you're, you've just simply got to take what comes up um, and roll with that as much as possible. One strategy that I have seen effective with individuals with autism, especially if you're doing trauma work, 
um, is when you're working on that trauma narrative, rather than writing that out in text, because these folks tend to not be as comfortable, and not always, but, but some folks tend to be less comfortable in uh, spoken and written language than they are thinking visually. Um, so I've done trauma narratives that were like cartoon strips or pictures or diagrams that they drew uh, and that we drew together and that we worked together and that that's been a really effective way to help them feel connected um, to the content in a way that, that written text just didn't seem to do. I, I, uh, so that's, that's the one suggestion I can offer. Dr. Montfort, I appreciate your time. Um, again, I will provide these slides to anyone who would like them, please contact cpaninfo at uthct.edu. I did post that in the chat area and we'll get those to you. If you have interest in any other topics for discussion for CPAN for educational opportunities, please let us know. Um, and feedback on our uh, presentation today is always welcome. Dr. Monfort, we really appreciate your time. My genuine pleasure. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great day. We have another CME coming up next week and information will be coming out on that soon. Thanks and have a great day. Bye-bye.